You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to Faith and Other Oddities, the show where Emily and I read the Bible, talk about it, and try to make some sense of what goes on there. <laughs> um, I mean, it makes sense, but uh, you kind of have to be either familiar with the ancient context or living in it. And since we don't have the option of the latter, um, we do our best to, to try to figure it out. Well, and the other big thing, too, I found out that's a major impediment for people reading the Bible is they don't realize how much repetition helps. Honestly, just read, read it, read it from a different version, read it from a kid's book, you know, listen to a different teacher, talk about the same thing. And the more you get that repetitive introduction into it, or, you know, I don't know, immersion into the, this, um, the stories, the more sense it's going to make. And, and that's something that's available to everyone, that you don't have to have a seminary education to do that. You don't have to be super smart. Just realize that you aren't going to be a Bible expert because you opened a Bible. And, yeah. you know? Yeah. And there's, and, there, there's, and there's some pretty, I mean, this sounds ridiculous, but there's some pretty ridiculous, like, not ridiculous, there's some pretty detailed comic book versions of the mm-hmm. Bible. Um, I don't recommend those for children necessarily. <laughs> Um, because there, there's a couple of them that I've seen that do get into some, some of the more graphic stories and you're like, Oh, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is in the Bible because a lot of times, I mean, particularly, I mean, because of the way we approach literature nowadays, uh, we tend to think if it's on the written page, um, it must not be that scandalous. Right. um, Especially if it's old. Right. Right. (laughs) So, you know, people didn't talk that way back then or something like that nature. Um, so yeah, yeah. It, anyway, <laughs> the, the, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. We just, uh, you, you, you got to find a different perspective and that's, that's why I like listening to lots of different teachers from lots of different angles, but. Well, and I yeah, found, so, you know, oh. I was just going to say, one of the things that I found is actually listening to people teach that I don't agree with. And either in mm-hmm. a book or, you know, through lecture and that's actually gets to, well, I'm argumentative by nature, but that really gets me to uh, think about stuff and process through in uh-huh. different ways. Uh-huh. And so I really, I like that because then I can, I can process it on a different level and I'm pushing back and I'm not just passively taking in information. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I know we've kind of, excuse me, um, got some kind of cold or allergies or something this week, but, um. I know we've talked about this quite a bit, but like just the, the ancient perspective, and I know anyone who listens to people like Dr. Heiser has heard ancient perspective, <laughs> you know, ad nauseum uh, right? at, at this point. I mean, no, I, mean, I say that jokingly, but that's the thing, is you're not going to understand a lot of this without the, the ancient uh, Near East perspective. And it, he was talking, uh, I've been listening back through all of the Naked Bible podcasts, so anyone who's listened to that, do yourself a favor and listen again. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, um, uh, but he was, um, he was doing some interviews and he was talking to someone about the, the ancient Near East perspective and how a lot of times people, um, when the, the, he gets the pushback of like, oh, why are you trying to impose that over the Bible? And he's like, that's <laughs> like trying to, it's like someone trying to say you're imposing Hebrew on the Old Testament right. or trying to impose Greek on the New <laughs> Testament. And he's like, it's, it's literally written in those languages and that's in that environment Mm -hmm. and so you know anyone who says we're trying to impose the ancient near east uh material onto the bible it's like no we're we're trying to show how the culture shaped the understanding so that we can have a better understanding and i don't know it's it's hard to articulate exactly how uh how important seeing those influences are i mean it really Mm -hmm. clears up uh, a lot of misunderstandings, particularly when you get in a lot of the more controversial passages, understanding the culture, understanding the Old Test- New Testament's use of the Old Testament, mm-hmm. uh, will save you from a lot of really ridiculous theology. Right. Uh, 
Well, you know, and I've been um, listening to, okay, for just the nerds out there, the British Museum has a ton, a ton of stuff on uh, YouTube right now because of COVID. They, and several museums do, just because they were putting things online and recording it. But anyway, uh, I've been listening to a lot of that. And I've been listening to a lot of stuff about ancient Roman lit- uh, religion. And, you know, you can see how this worldview that Heiser often talks about, this divine council worldview, is just part of the 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 culture and the, the how people thought. And it wasn't something that was isolated or uh, so radical to anyone at that time. So they wouldn't have explained it. They wouldn't have stopped to try to to break down these controversial passages because they weren't controversial. They're only controversial well, to us. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's like if right now, if I told you I drove to the store to go buy groceries, I wouldn't explain to you what a grocery bag is, mm-hmm. what a grocery store is, what a car is. And that you I mean, didn't draw you it? Were, you didn't sketch well, it out? Unless, <laughs> right, exactly. And Unless you were from someplace else that didn't have cars or grocery stores exactly. or grocery bags. Um, so there, there's no need for me to explain all of those things to you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, that, and that's the beautiful point. I mean, if we, if we can stop getting over, you know, start getting over our own hubris about the idea that our modern perspectives are the end all be all and define all of reality, uh, we might have a chance to learn something. And so, you know, that's another way, even though it doesn't seem like I'm learning about the Bible, listening to these lectures on ancient Rome or Greece or Egypt or the Mesopotamian re- uh, region, because they aren't specifically labeled Bible lessons, I'm actually picking up a lot of information that's helping me understand things that I had accepted on faith, but now I'm seeing them at play in the in the rest of the world. So, I, you know, if you're really into trying to understand the Bible, it's your study is going to encompass more than just reading the text. It's just that simple. You're going to have to to branch out. Now, can you get your basic, you know, practice and faith message from the, just reading the Bible? Absolutely. But for any kind of context or depth, you're going to have to go outside the Bible to get some information. So. Well, and I think that I think that does. Be, I mean, we go into a lot of really in depth stuff, uh, <laughs> and a lot of our study, um, which I love. I mean, I, I it's just know, me being we, geeky. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, I mean, you know, offline, we've had conversations that'll last five, six hours at times mm-hmm. just about these topics. You're stupid by and, <laughs> Oh, yeah. Just absurd little bits of detail. But I think that's kind of interesting. It speaks to uh, how simple the gospel is, mm-hmm. that it you don't have to have all of this stuff to encounter, uh, have a saving encounter with Jesus. I mean, right. that's... It, it's just it really adds can to it. be it really can be very simple and the rest is just getting to know god mhm mhm I mean, just that's, that's just really getting to it, know god i mean no i mean <laughs> i mean i i mean I, I i i know i that sounds like very flippant but it's not I, it, but i'm saying it it's it doesn't have an impact on your uh on your salvation and right. on your place in the kingdom um mm-hmm. other than um your desire to know God more and, and do more or, you know, mm-hmm. it, I don't know how much doing more even does. I mean, if, <laughs> how do you quantify that? You know? Well, um, you, I, I don't, it, it's a weird kind of linguistic problem. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's just the enjoyment. It, it, it really is. It's just about mm-hmm. the enjoyment and experience in the relationship. And so does it add to your salvation? Absolutely not. Does it, does it enhance the relationship? Yes, it does. And so you, you, it's like, you know, that, that the, the marriage metaphor, I could be married to Ty. And if I never share in any of the things that he enjoys or he's doing or that he appreciates, am I really going to enjoy the fact we're married? We can hmm. still be married, but I'm never going to get to enjoy him as a person if I don't engage. That's why I learned to fish and I can outfish my husband now. So, uh, you know, it's the, not that you're ever going to outfish God. Uh, but, you know, it's that kind of thing where you just go, I, I want to to enjoy the things that they do so I can be with them. And yeah, so. Well, and I, I, and I, I will say I, the, the two biggest things I've gained from from studying a lot of this is um, it makes me feel a lot less important and more humble. Right. <laughs> but at the same time, a lot more loved mm-hmm. um, by God. 
Um, it kind of takes, That's a you good know, point. not to, uh, not to denigrate anyone in the way that they share the gospel, but it takes it from the message of, oh, I screwed up, which, you know, we do. I'm not going <laughs> to deny that all have sinned, you know, that, um, but it takes it away from, oh, you screwed up. So that made God really angry. And mm-hmm. now you need him to come fix it. Um, yeah. which there, I mean, that's, that's a really simplified version, but you mm-hmm. go, oh, it's not just about me. It's about the world and not just about the world as in humanity. Mm-hmm. It's about our influence on creation as well mm-hmm. and how we need to be running the world correctly and how that's going to happen in the new creation. Um, so yeah, it definitely I think that's takes such a- the emphasis off of that. It, it takes it, it takes it from being just this transactional type of relationship Almost into something narcissistic. better that you, yeah, that you can look forward to. Well, but yeah. I think that's a huge, a huge shift that I think a lot of us need to make where it's not about just this one time momentary, uh, you know, God says here, you, you, you've got your invitation. Uh, it, it is about stewardship. It is about those commands in Genesis. It is about how we do impact the world and all of creation through the way we conduct ourselves and how we are in relationship with God. And that's, I mean, for me, that was a major, major shift in my paradigm and how I thought about this and to think about, you know, sin is damaging, not just on a very personal individual level, but to my environment. And, you know, not just hurtful to the people around me, which I think we kind of get that, but like literally to my environment, it has an impact on the earth. Um, that That's huge. And I, I think that helped me understand a little bit more how I need to conduct myself and, and why it's important that I actually try to operate in harmony with the creator. And, you know, I'm a huge outdoor nature lover and stuff like that. I, I you know, put me outside, I'm happier. And so for me, that that opened up a different level of understanding uh, than just about anything else I'd been taught. And I think that's the reason why we have to be looking at these issues from multiple different angles, because there's going to be one angle that clicks with you in a way that it, others just won't. And so you, you need that input to, to get a better, more rounded um, understanding of what God's accomplishing through and with and despite you. So anyway, I know we kind of like randomness because you were in this weekend, and we, but we didn't get a chance to like sit down and nerd out because it was just a crazy weekend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so much sugar. So much sugar. Like literally I'm bagging it up and giving it to my neighbors so much sugar because I just need it out of my house. So <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But um, we're in First Kings eight, and we were um, we left off in verse fourteen, and that was when God's glory had filled the temple, and um, Solomon had then was getting ready to make his address and say his dedication prayer, and so we're going to pick up in verse fifteen, and we were I, I had mentioned how Solomon, um, if you. If you listen to what he says, Solomon is really going to be talking about the the presence of God in the temple as confirmation that he is both the rightful king and heir and son, the actual son of David. Because remember, that was a point that was in dispute because Bathsheba had been married to Uriah before this. So whether or not he was actually David's son was a question that some people had. And then plus... He had killed off all his other brothers who were vying for the throne. So was he really the right son to inherit? Another big question. And Solomon is going to take this opportunity to really affirm to the people, look, here's the evidence that, yes, I'm the rightful king. David is my father, and God has chosen me to do this. And if you read through what he says, uh, I'm working through the prayer. I haven't got all my notes on it done yet, but I'm not about... A third of the way through the prayer, and I think I've already got him saying David, my father, six times. So, I mean, he's really driving this point home. So, we'll pick up in verse 15. It says, And he said, Bless the Lord, best, blessed be the Lord, God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled the promise with his mouth to David, my father, saying, 
since the day I brought my people of Israel out of Egypt. That's referenced back to that Song of the Sea in Exodus 15. Um, make sure I got my notes here. I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build my house that my, that my name might be there. But I chose David to be over my people, Israel. So in a parallel verse, because like, this is a crazy verse, and it really twisted my wires for a minute. Um, so in the parallel verse, this is in Second Chronicles 6, 5. It says, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build my house, that my name might may be there, and I chose no man as a prince over my people, Israel. So really weird verse because it sounds like God did not choose anything that you know this is kind of just random happenstance uh but and it seems like it could be like a uh you know a slam dunk for those of us who affirm free will if we don't read all of the verse in first kings 8 so we know that David was chosen so we've got to figure out what in the world is going on here and the context is what, what matters, because without the context, you wind up with this very contradictory, nonsensical mess in the theme of things. So the, the first point that the rabbis camped out on, they said, this is showing, number one, how interconnected and inter intertwined the kingship and the building of the temple were. The two go together. You cannot have a temple without a king. You don't have a king without a temple. It goes together. And so the function, so the two issues are functionally interconnected, and so the the establishment of the divinic throne or the reestablishment of the divinic throne in the future is really the reason. This is the reason why they have that idea of the third temple going hand in hand. Why so many Christians, when we talk about the 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 um, reign and rule of Christ on the earth, his return, we talk about that third temple. Now, I. Listening to Heiser, I've kind of shifted that we are the third temple, so I'm not really looking for the reestablishment of a um, brick and mortar third temple. I, I don't think it's impossible. It may very well happen. Um, but the idea that you have to have a temple if the king is going to reign. And so this really does have some interesting implications for Christians, though, when we get to thinking about if we're considering ourselves to be the third temple. And the third temple is essential for the Davidic king, i.e. Jesus, to reign upon this earth once again. So very fun concept to play with. I didn't go into any kind of breakdown on it, but I just wanted to throw that out. We'll talk more about that when we get to the New Testament stuff. Um, but, you know, here's, here's the basis for a lot of these New Testament ideas. And this is the reason why you've got to have that Old Testament uh, information in order to understand the New Testament stuff. What I find to be most interesting in how the rabbis read this is it's a statement on how God acts in history. Um, they're saying that basically, and I'm paraphrasing here, that God didn't choose a man or a location at the Exodus. Uh, or to rephrase it, God didn't make a single specific determinative decision dictating David's life for Jerusalem's fate at the time of the Exodus. Instead, God is present in the culmination of choices that occur throughout history. So we can go back to when God chose Judah as the tribe that the king would come through. We can go back to that time when God chose Canaan as the place where his people are going to live. Or we, when he chose the territories for the tribe of Judah to inherit that encompassed Jerusalem. And then whenever he chose Jesse's family, that encompassed the person of David. And then within those sweeping choices, these broad stroke kind of choices that God made and helped guide people into, um, you know, one person arose and presented himself as willing and worthy to participate in the next step of the journey. That it was not that God said, I'm going to create David specifically to fulfill this um, purpose is the way the rabbis read it. And I, I tend to lean towards that in a lot of ways, that there is a place for humanity to step up and participate and to join with what God's doing. And that, yes, he does have, you know, um, decreed purpose and function and his will that he's going to carry out on this earth, that nobody's going to change that. And building the temple, I think, is one of them. But at the same time, there's like wiggle room, there's space for humans to be humans within that space, uh, within those decisions and decrees. So 
we read this, or they're reading this, both as a cumulative process and a process which God demonstrates great patience in order to bring his will about. So he's like, you know, he set the stage, so to speak, and now we're waiting for the right actor to step onto it and take their part because the right person is going to emerge when the circumstances are are arranged just so. And so even before David had um, been chosen, God had declared that David was better than Saul. That's in 1 Samuel 15, 28. And then when we get to looking at who David was and why he was the right person, David composed the Psalms. And whenever he's summoned to um, Saul's court, we're told God is with him. That's 1 Samuel 16, 18. This is, you know, Yes, David is not king yet. He doesn't have the ability to build a temple. But David was already manifesting that he had a strong, well-informed, real relationship and understanding of the person of God and wanted to serve God. And he seems to be chosen as king because of this prior devotion, not that he gained the devotion because he was chosen as king. So in Deuteronomy 12, Moses lays out the process by which God will choose the place in Israel for the temple. He says that, and I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but to give you an idea, he says that the Israelites are going to go in and they're going to destroy the places where the nations worshipped their gods. They're going to tear down their altars. They're going to chop down their carved images of their gods, and they're going to burn the Asherim. And so... um. In verse 5 specifically, it says, But you shall seek out the place that the Lord will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go. And again, in uh, in verse 11, it says, God will choose. Now, the the verb there is bakar. It's a, um, oh, uh, in the perfect, um, imperfect form. Now, Hebrew is a funny, funny language because a lot of the verbs aren't really time-based. They they don't exist in past, present, and future like English verbs. So when we translate them, it's kind of difficult to to grab hold of the nuance because English is far more precise than Hebrew. Hebrew is a very abstract, uh, paint with a broad brush kind of language, which is what I really like about it. Um, so this imperfect form of this verb means it's not done. It's not complete. It's not finished. It's it's still in process. And so there's a, um, there's an understanding here that when God, when Moses writes that God will choose that God's still in the process of choosing. Now, um, the, the passage here in Deuteronomy seems to be very clear God, that God's in this process. However, we can't automatically assume that. And this is the reason why we can't automatically assume this, because this incomplete action can actually just be from the perspective of the writer. So Moses may not have the complete knowledge of who God is going to choose for king and where God's going to put the temple. So it's not a slam dunk for those of us who do affirm free will. And I and I think we need to be clear about that because it would be so easy to twist this and go, oh, well, see, God didn't actually have it laid out in a certain path. Um, you know, that there is, he was still in the process because he didn't know. I'm not saying he didn't know that. Let's be clear about that. Um, there, There's that room in there for God to know how humanity is going to respond to him and who's going to do what and for God to sit back and wait and to to do the things that kind of present the best option for us to step forward and participate with him. And so the writer of Deuteronomy is saying, I don't know. No one knows. Maybe God knows. Now, the, I think he probably says God definitely knows. But uh, hush, we got a dog under the desk. Uh, DeVries, who wrote the word commentary, he seems to follow the rabbinic line of thought. And he reads this as an affirmation of the interdependence of the Davidic dynasty and the temple. And he goes on to explain that Solomon is stating God chose the man, not the uh, not a city, and this is legitimizing um, Solomon's own claim to the throne. So Solomon was to build, uh, could not build the temple unless he was David's son, and we already kind of talk about that. 
we're going to get some more into this because Solomon is going to really belabor this point. In verse 17, it says, now it was in the heart of my father. Again, that's the second time that Solomon says, um, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And in verse 18, it says, but the Lord said to David, my father, third time, where it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well, and that was that it was in your heart. So here was my thing I got to thinking about. How long had David desired to build a temple? And this is, I mean, it seems like a weird question to ask, I know, but you know, when we when we read through David's story, it seems like in 2 Samuel 7, David go, looks around one day and goes, oh no, I'm living in a house and God's living in a tent. This can't happen. We have to correct this. But was that really when he decided that it was appropriate for him to build a temple? And I think there's some evidence pointing to the fact that this desire to build a temple was far, far older than just the fact that, you know, he became king and he suddenly had a, a capital city to live in. So if you read to, go back to David's Psalms and you look at where they fit into the timeline, you're going to find that over and over again, you're going to have these references to the temple. You're going to have references to Zion. And this is long, some of them are long before the temple was built. Now, I know it's very popular. A lot of academics are going to say, hey, this was edited in there. This was added. You know, David may have written the the first part of this, and then somebody else came along and added these last few verses that talk about the temple. Or, you know, there's this, there, there's that debate. But I don't know. I think that we can hang on to, to Davidic authorship and inspiration and read it with the temple and actually see where David's heart was. I think this gives us a, a clue into what David was thinking. Because if you look at uh, Psalm 9, this happens at um, 1 Samuel 17. Oh my goodness, I wrote down the the um, the reference, but I didn't write what was happening. So this is David and Goliath. Yeah. So Psalm 9, verse 17, uh, uh, chapter 17, David and Goliath he's already talking about the temple. In um, Psalm 5, 1 Samuel 18, which 1 Samuel 18 was uh, whenever Jonathan had to send David away. Uh, you know, he's already talking about the temple. Uh, Psalm 11, which is entitled, The Lord in His Holy Temple, is thought to be written when, in Samuel 19. That's when Saul is trying to kill David. Um, then Psalm 26, which is uh, Jonathan warning David. Then, uh, let's see, what else? Psalm 20, <laughs> that's in 2 Samuel 10. And so it, it just keeps going and going. You, you see these references, all of these, these psalms that happen before David says, hey, I think I need to build a temple. They're... They've been written. They were written prior to this time, if what we think is correct, you know, as far as the writing dates are correct. And they all reference either God's temple, Zion, God's holy hill. So um, we can continue to look at other Psalms where David throughout his life is talking about this desire to build a temple or what he envisions the temple looking like. And, um, you know, the more I looked at these Psalms, the more I began to think David always had this desire to, to build the temple. It was just part of who he was. And I don't think he just suddenly decided to do it. And I, you know, that's speculation on my part, but this really does to be, seem to be an all consuming, almost obsession with David to build this temple. And, and so if so, if I'm correct, and I may not, I may be completely incorrect, I can own that. This is speculation, and so I ought to be clear. Um, but this seems to fit with the biblical pattern we are that we see throughout the rest of the Bible, which is, you know, God wants to do something, God decides to do something, and there's a person who shares in this desire, and then God either corrects or he strengthens that desire or that behavior in order to fulfill his purpose. 
and yeah, you know, and this cuts both ways, um, whether good or bad. And, you know, I think one of the most famous um, passages that addresses this is Pharaoh. This is the one that people uh, talk about a lot. Well, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and God made him say no. But if you actually look back in Exodus and read through the entire story, starting at Exodus 7, 13, 14, and 22, or so, uh, Exodus 8, 15, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. Pharaoh says, this is what I'm going to do. He, he makes this decision for himself. And it's not until the fifth plague where God then steps in and says, hey, buddy, this is what you want. You're going to ride this one out. And I'm going to make sure that you don't lose the will to, to stand up before me because now we've started down this path. You're going to stay on this path. And so Pharaoh picked the path he was going to be on and God just wouldn't let him get out of that decision. And so I think we, we need to remember that it wasn't like God said, I'm going to, to punish this guy who would have been really nice to Moses and make him be by being mean to him. You know, it, it's, it's not that God wasn't like pulling puppet strings. No, Pharaoh chose this. Uh, another uh, big example that I see is everybody wants to point out, well, Paul on the road to Damascus, you know, God showed up in a blinding light and that's when he, he suddenly understood who Jesus was. Well, that's when he understood who Jesus was, but we have to remember he was already in pursuit of God. He already wanted to follow and obey and serve God. He had spent years studying with Gamaliel. Uh, he was a rabbi among a rabbi, a Pharisee among the Pharisees. What? He knew his Bible. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to know God better. This wasn't like he woke up one day and says, I want to know God better and started killing Christians. He, he really did see Christianity as being in opposition to, to what he learned to be true about God. So God redirected him. God said, if you want to serve me, you have to embrace Jesus. You have to understand Christianity is the next step. So it wasn't like Paul was saying, I don't want anything to do with God. I don't want anything to do with Jesus. God just had to clarify his understanding. And so I bring all that up because I, I think there's a basis here for thinking David really wanted to build a temple and God says, okay, we're going to start moving you in that path to accomplish what your heart desire is. So, because it's in concert with my desire, it's what I want. And so now we can participate in this together. And so, um, this this verse, I I think it's talking about, and this is again keeping with the, the Jewish reading, is that uh, God didn't immediately establish who the person was or where the temple was once they left Egypt. That this was a culminating, you know, a series of events and choices and allowing people that to do what uh, needed to be done to position themselves so that one person would arise and realize this is the next step. This is where we need to go. And, um, you know, I think it's really pointing to the fact that God was willing to wait. I mean, Deuteronomy 12, those commands about what God said the people needed to do before a temple could be um, built had not yet been fulfilled. So, because if you go back to Judges 2, we're told that Israel serves Baals and there were God went after the gods of the people around them. Judges 3, there's idols in Gilgal. Judges 6, Gideon destroys the Baal uh, idol that his father had. Judges 8, Gideon makes an ephod for people to worship. Judges 10, the Israelites serve Baals, Asheroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of um, Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. I This is happening throughout the book of Judges. From the time they get to the promised land, to the time that, that Saul takes the throne. Judges 17, Micah has an idol in his home. His sons are priests. Judges 18, the Danites steal that idol, set up another place to worship in their own new city. And this has all happened over the space of roughly three to 400 years that the people of Israel have not bothered to do what God told them to do in Deuteronomy. And so during that time, um, you know, God is worshipped in various locations like Shiloh and Nob. Um, and he's also still worshipped in the high places that's been established. Uh, we really don't have a return to national worship, concerted, you know, unified worship of Yahweh until Samuel. 
And that's whenever we start to see these changes going on. Saul serves, uh, seems to have made some kinds of religious reforms, um, most notably demonstrated by the ma- banishment of the witches or mediums, the obes, um, from the land. And we should remember that just the act of driving out the Ammonites and the Amalekites and the Philistines, that is a type of religious reform because that's part of getting these other gods out of the land of Canaan, making sure that the people are are looking to God himself, not to foreign idols. And then David, of course, picks up on that. So it's not until we have a king that we see the conditions of Deuteronomy 12 being fulfilled. So, you know, God let the people do what they wanted to do during Judges. He let them go after these other Baals. Now, was there consequences? Absolutely. But he didn't, you know, make it where they had no ability to chase after these other gods. He let them do that. And until they were willing to step into this position of being his people and living out the decrees that he had given them, he didn't bless them with the centralized place of worship where he would be manifest. And I think that's the reason why David was chosen because it was in his heart to see these things fulfilled. And so I I think that's kind of backwards to how we kind of read it. I think we kind of read it, oh, God chose David, and this is why he wants to build a temple. I think think it's the other way around. And so um, now Solomon is saying the time wasn't what I think he's saying. And again, I'm going to make that very clear. This is my viewpoint on this. I think Solomon's saying the time wasn't right before. But now's the time God has the has proven the time is right. <laughs> I've, got, I've got notes that are written very sloppily. Uh, anyway, I think Solomon is saying now we're proving that the time is right, or God is proving the time is right because he's affirming the fact that I got to build the temple. He's manifesting himself in the temple. And so I actually managed to do this, and I am the king. And so the two, again, they go together. and so. I, to me, that's just a really cool picture that I don't think is brought out a lot when we're talking about the Old Testament stories, um, that God is really participating with humanity to to shape history, and that there is this long-suffering patience that God extends to us. So I, I, I just, I love that idea, and like I said, it could be wrong, uh, but Evidently, I wouldn't have shared it unless I thought I was right. So, verse 19. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son who shall be born to you shall build the house for my name. Verse 20. Now the Lord has fulfilled his purpose that he made. That Yeah. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made. For I have risen in the place of David, my father. Fourth time we have David, my father. And sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. So Solomon goes to great length to make it very clear in this opening address that he is a David's son. Yes, David wanted to build the temple. God says, no, your son can. Solomon built the temple. Therefore, he is David's son. That he, this is the, the equation that Solomon set up and really pushed the, the people to, to view it in totality. If he hadn't been David's son, he wouldn't have been able to build the temple. That simple. So I see your wheels turning. Nope. I'm just, I was trying to make sure I've got a, ever a handle on everything to figure out. I guess we are kind of where, where we started still. We, um, well, and, and Solomon, I mean, he, he's not going to let us get by without seeing this. So he's going to attack it from a couple of different uh, perspectives. To, sure. Uh, so, but, uh, but no, I, I am. Um, Sorry, I'm because I'm congested. I my, my I'm sitting here thinking, trying not to uh, interrupt too much. Yeah, no, I, I I I understand. It'd be a lot more fun if you did interject, but okay, I'll forgive you this time. Verse twenty one, it says, "And there I have provided a place for the ark, in which is the covenant of the Lord that He made with our fathers when He brought Him out of brought them out of." Egypt. So um, basically, Solomon's saying, look, if you doubt anything I say, look, I brought the ark home. You can't just haul this thing around on an ox cart. You have to be the right person handling it the right way, bringing it to the right place, or you die. 
the people knew this because of David, when David initially tried to move the ark in, with the period of Judges, when the Philistines captured the ark, Solomon is pointing to his ability to move the ark without anyone dying as further evidence, this is who I am, this is what I'm supposed to do. So Solomon is making this point, he's the rightful king, he's the rightful heir of David, he is the proper son to set on um, on the throne. Now, when he references that the covenant of God that he made with their fathers when they came out of Israel, he's tying himself back into the history and the practice of um, and presenting himself as the appropriate continuation of this covenant. And because now we've established I am David's son, but in reality, who I am goes much deeper. I'm I'm one of the children of Israel who came out of Egypt. I my bloodlines flow directly out of that place in Exodus. Everything we're doing is a culmination of what started there. And so once Solomon has addressed the present situation, he goes back to make that declaration about the past. And now he moves into his prayer of dedication. He's established who he is. He's established where he fits in the timeline. Now, verse 22, it says, Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread his hands towards the heavens. Now, Raymond Dillard, who he is um, the author of the word commentary on uh, Second Chronicles, he reads this raising of the hands as a... Um, significant gesture which conveys the procedure of taking an oath to the temple. Uh, let me just read what he says so I don't mess it up. It says, Solomon's prayers transfers to the temple the oath procedure which had ordinarily been administ uh, administered at the tabernacle and other holy sites. So from Genesis to Revelation, we find this raising of the hands as part of the oath taking process. I mean, we still do it today. If you're in court and you're going to, you take an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, you raise your hand. Uh, but we first find it in Genesis 14, 22. And this is when Abram says to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God, most high possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours. So that's our first reference to raising the hand. Our, our last reference in the Bible to raising the hands is Revelation 10, 5 through 6. And it says the angel who was standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever and who created the earth and what is in it and the sea and what is in it. There would be no more delay. And so um, I'm not sure if I see the, the full transfer of the oath procedure to the temple. I mean, obviously, it's a holy site. So this is where oaths are going to, to be taken and fulfilled. Uh, when we have a Nazarene vow, which is a little different than an oath, that's going to happen. Nazarite vow. That, thank you. Uh, Nazarite vow. Uh, so you aren't completely out of it. Um, that's going to happen at the temple. But there's going to... Um, there is definitely the connection of the oaths and the the holy sites in which now the temple is the holy site. But I think it goes back more to the covenant promises, because when we read the rest of Solomon's prayer, we're going to keep going back to this, um, this covenant ideology and this covenant languages um, that he's going to be talking in. It's not going to be... Um, divorced from the overall historical setting and, and the nation's uh, history that God has led them through. So uh, I think that there's this appeal uh, for God to remember his promises to the people of Israel. It also an appeal to remember the promises to the land, to care for the land, uh, for Israel, uh, and for Solomon himself. So all of this is going to be connected because all of these things fall under those covenant promises. and. Um, so I see that I see the connection uh, as far as promises and oaths and that sort of thing. Yeah, I get that. But, uh, you know, just a reminder, it's OK not to agree with everybody who writes a commentary, even a good commentary. Um, sure. So I, I I think he, you know, he gave me something new to think about. Um, but I just I I don't see it as, as finely pointed as, as he's got it. So verse 23, and said, O Lord, talking about Solomon, 
and said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in the heaven or on the earth beneath, keeping uh, covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. So this is a callback to that Abrahamic covenant we just talked with the gods of uh, heaven and earth kind of language. And we also hear it again, of course, in um, Revelation. But also the walk before me, that's in Genesis 17. God says, if you walk before me, and you know that's part of the covenant. Uh, we also have a reminder that Song of the Sea, that's a very important piece in this. You've got to know that Song of the Sea for what Solomon's saying to make sense. That's Exodus 15. Because remember, Exodus 15, 11 reads, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Solomon here is saying, you know, there is no God like you. And so we have that callback, that, that dedication to this one single unique God who, who is completely unlike anything else. Solomon's um, telling us that um, this, is, uh, this is something that he's participating in that is a fulfillment of God's promises. It's, it, it, it's God being true to his word. It's God keeping his covenant because now Israel does have a king. Israel does have a temple. So even though Solomon's a participant in it, he didn't do this by his own design or initiative. He, he, yes, he wanted to participate, but it's God who, who created the circumstances that allowed him to participate. And that this really did begin with a promise to Abraham that was re, um, renewed at Exodus and at the Sinai. Uh, and it's realized in part by David, but now Solomon's getting to fulfill it on a different level as the son and successor of David. And, you know, and this is, this is how it works. This is how biblical history works. There is a promise of this unchanging God from Genesis 1 through the end of Revelation until today, where if we get to see how he operates in these points in history and we get to understand how he's caring about humanity, now all of a sudden he makes sense. He's not capricious. He's not making random, arbitrary decisions about our existence and our well-being. There's actually a sense and an order and a purpose behind it, and we get to decide where we participate. So, verse twenty-four: You have kept with you kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth and with your hand fulfilled it in this day. So he strengthens the point. God spoke this to David with his mouth. This is not something David heard secondhand. A prophet did not deliver this message. God was, uh, David was sitting before the altar. This is 2 Samuel chapter 7. He was talking with God. Um, and so there is no doubt God has been involved in this venture from the very beginning before Solomon had even been born. Uh, so he's deflecting, in a way, some of the credit from himself. He's actually putting that back on God. So verse 25, now therefore, now therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, what you promised him, saying, you shall not lack a man to sit before him on the throne of Israel, if only your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Now, here Solomon is referring to that covenant that God made with David in 2 Samuel. And really, this is a good time to go back and read what that, that covenant. I'm not going to do it, but you know, uh, before you continue with the rest of the Solomon's prayer, go back and read that covenant. It takes, you know, 10 minutes tops. Uh, go back and read Exodus 15. Read Genesis 14 and then 16, I think, and 17. Um, read those passages. Hear the language there. Listen to what's being said, because you're going to see the similarities that I'm talking about. This isn't some hidden knowledge. This is just you've got to, to be familiar enough with your Bible, or if you have one of those really great um, uh, biblical uh, software systems that can pick out phrases for you, uh, you can see how these themes are consistent. And so uh, what's interesting about what Solomon says here is he adds a stipulation. Now, in 2 Samuel 7, there's no stipulation. Um, there's a promise with absolutely no conditions. David's son would be God's son. When David's son sinned, God doesn't abandon him or disown him. Instead, he, he's going to chastise him. He's going to discipline him in order to maintain the relationship, in order to correct him so the relationship can be maintained, uh, might be a better way to put it. And so now Solomon is... Um, 
is saying there are conditions for David's sons to remain on the throne. Now, Paul House, and he wrote the um, New American Commentary. I have to remember which one. <laughs> he notes that Solomon's prayer is firmly, quote, firmly grounded in the text like Levit Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 27 and 28, where Moses tells Israel that God will richly bless them for obeying the covenant, but punish them severely for rebellion. So in the, in the Torah, over and over again, we have this if-then condition. You obey me, then you'll get blessings. The, you know, if, if you do these things that I've commanded you to do, there's going to be rain. There's going to be good crops. There's going to be peace. If you don't, there's consequences. And this is what they are. And a lot of the consequences, I mean, disease and famine and, you know, being overrun by foreign military powers, which we saw throughout the book of Judges, this is something that's promised um, within the Torah. So I'm getting the, the scratchy throat now. Now, if you remember, um, when we went through Second Samuel 7, um, Brigaman was like really just the stellar commentator on this that to help with understanding. And he makes this helpful distinction for us. He says God will enact sanctions and punishments, but they're not terminal. So in other words, yes, there's going to be consequences. That's that chastisement. That's that discipline talked about in Second Samuel. There's going to be consequences, but they're not terminal. I, I kind of like that um, distinction there. Um, Bergerman says that if the if has been silenced, it's not been nullified. So the if it, it, it has kind of gotten smaller. It, it's, not, it's not something that's going to completely erase you as a person. It, it's just going to make sure that you don't forget who's in charge, which is important because at this point in time, kings really viewed themselves as the embodiment or sons of God, which, I mean, Solomon is because that's in 2 Samuel 7 that God says he's going to adopt David's son. But this... You, you tell somebody they're the son of God, you tell people that they're the embodiment of God, watch how quickly their arrogance and conceit leads them to some sort of stupidity. I mean, this happens throughout all of history. Um, what is it? Absolute power corrupts absolutely is the quote. Um, so, you know, this is what happens with human nature. So what Solomon is saying is in addition to the covenant. now. Here's the question. We don't know how many other conversations God had with David. We don't know um, what else was revealed at other times. We just have this one specific moment that's captured. And I think sometimes we forget that not everything God said to people is written in the Bible, that there are things that we, we miss out on. But Solomon is embedding this promise within the context of the Torah. He's not saying that the Torah has somehow been suspended for the kings of Israel. He's saying what Samuel had said, the kings of Israel are still very much to be submissive and subordinate to the laws God has put in place for them. There is no exemption for kings to act as if God's law does not apply to them, which is a radical concept when we're talking about kingship in the Middle Ages. But Solomon's also providing the vindication for the exile that's going to happen later in 2 Kings. And that's going to be you know, a major turning point in Israel's history that is really going to mess with people's theology. Why? Because for some reason, They've got this idea that if they have this talisman, this magic token of a temple, that God must love them enough to protect them, that God's not going to let his temple be destroyed. While totally missing the point, the temple, it, it does not serve as some kind of force field against other gods. The other thing too, God doesn't need a temple because he's not really housed in the temple. God just deigns to stop by and you know allow part of himself to reside there so, right and i think you know that's sometimes we as christians uh we we have this idea that oh i you know i said a prayer once so now i i don't have to worry about consequences and things going wrong for me it's kind of like right. this little talisman we retreat it like we treat it like a magical object uh, and, or some kind of incantation, which is so wrong. Um, well, I mean, uh, and and here's uh, a point too. If you look at you know man as the image bearer, as the idol, quote unquote, that was put into the 
the garden, um, you know, if we're looking at the as mm-hmm. a temple account, and I hate to use the word of people as an idol because <laughs> right. we don't bow down and worship people, but you know, as as our as we are the image representing God in the garden and in the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, why would why would the existence of a physical temple stop anything from happening when we are constantly people in the world, right? Are constantly abusing and mistreating the very image of God. You know that. Yeah, it's not. You know, it, he's not going to treat his temple with any more regard than we are <laughs> treating his image. I mean, Ooh. if we really want to uh, to break it down. Um, and then you go into things like, you know, you go into the prophetic books and God talks about, hey, why are you in exile? Because you mistreated the poor, mm-hmm. because you, uh, you abused people. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, there's very much a, uh, y- y- if you're looking for, you know, for the, the temple to be the thing that protects you, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not how it's going to be. Right. And, well, and we, we've got to stop thinking that, and I know we've said this before, and I feel like I've said it 20 times in the last five days. God's love is wholly unconditional. We, we can rest in that promise. That's fine. But expressions of love are never unconditional. They always involve conditions. And usually those conditions involve actively being a participant and respecting and honoring the relationship you're in that that's it's it's easy i mean it's not a hard metaphor to understand when especially when we do put it in the, that marriage context where you know if you want to be a part of this marriage uh, married partnership then you don't sleep with other people you don't you know stay out all night you don't ignore my calls you you know those things that you just don't do if you want to maintain the relationship Um, well and if you you want to if well and even beyond just maintaining the relationship i mean if you look at the way that and uh, the way that so many churches um look at marriage the legal contract um Mm -hmm. the you know as far as as long as that's not violated anything inside must be okay because you've got this marriage contract that says you're married and yeah. and so yeah. they tolerate all yeah and so so many churches i mean it, it, and we've talked about this before where so many churches tolerate all kinds of abuses and mistreatment of of women and and men you mm-hmm. know but to to the point where there are people you know in abusive situations uh, mental physical even you know to the point some people dying and the mm-hmm. church is going oh well you know it's, but make sure you don't Make sure you're not divorced. Like that, like the paper itself is going to be some kind of magic charm that that makes everything okay in the end. Right. Yeah. And when reality, the covenant was broken by anyone who who violates another person that way. And so I, yeah. And you know, there's a term for people who just continue to treat an abuser well. It's called enabling. And so, yep. you know, that's it, it, not how it works. God is, and God's not an enabler. I, he, he doesn't, he, he's not a dysfunctional God. He's not mentally unstable with emotional scars that keep him from functioning in a healthy way with us and towards us. And yeah. so I, I think we. Yeah. And, and, and how, well, I'm say, and how often in this debate, and I saw this again just last week, where somebody brought up First Corinthians seven five, where it says, you know, well, wives aren't supposed to deprive their husbands. That's not what First Corinthians seven five says. <laughs> it says, do not deprive each other. Um, yeah. and so it's a command for both. And so, you know, if the husband's going to be using that to get sex, you need to just think if there's any ways he's depriving the wife. Mm-hmm. And and it said, and and this person even went on to say, you know, that's what God commands. But if you get to the end of the uh, the, the paragraph, um, or towards the end of the paragraph, he says, Paul says, this, I say this as a concession, not as a command. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the, it, this is the thing. It, the, it's the mutuality. And that's what made this crazy was because it gave women the same rights as it gave men. That was what blew people's minds. This is the reason why it was controversial. Husbands always, throughout all of history, had the rights to their wives' bodies whenever, however they deemed it fitting. 
it was women who who had to say, hey, I need attention. And so that's mm-hmm. that's the thing. This is the reason why Paul's words are so crazy. And I I wish more people understood that. And and just to to be very blunt, you know, with my work with Scandalous and the the women in that group and talking to various women, um, so often what I find it's not men going, man, I wish my wife were more receptive to me. It's women going, I wish he actually cared. I wish he wanted to participate in this. So you know, this is the reason why the Bible addresses that because yeah, that's the dirty little secret that we don't talk about in the church that women might actually have a sex drive. Uh, and Paul said this needs to be dealt with and this needs to be addressed in a loving, kind way within a marriage. So um, yeah, I know that's like way off topic from Kings, but I mean, it's just it's one of those well, things yeah, that but, irritates me. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we, well, we got here talking about the temple being the magic. Uh, talisman that protects Israel. You know, mm-hmm. as long as you don't do this, and and that's really. And then you then you were talking about the marriage uh, metaphor, yeah, analogy that yeah metaphor that the Bible uses. But it's like, well, if we're if we're going to use that and we're going to talk about it, let, <laughs> let's talk about some application here. Uh, just because you just because you have a legally binding certificate doesn't there are a legal certificate doesn't necessarily mean that you're any better off than anyone in the same situation who's not married. And, and you know, I, I know that there are so many churches who put more stock in the marriage certificate than how people are told to treat each other. Mm-hmm. And I know this because if you have a couple who are living together who are not married, no matter what's going on, I've known pastors that regardless of anything that was going on would tell them that they have to move out. Now, do do I think it's right or good to do that without making a marriage commitment, I think you should be married. But I guarantee you, I, I've heard this, I, I've seen this from the stories you've told, or I, I haven't seen it, but you've told me a lot of this from the, the people you've talked to on Scandalous. Again, not going to name names, but this could be a hundred stories. Right. Where people have gone to pastors and they're like, oh, well, oh, he's, he's abusive. Well, you just need to pray more, but make sure, you know, God hates divorce. Mm-hmm. And they're putting more stock in the marriage certificate than the than the way we're told to treat each other and you know and we as christians we as believers we should be the ones who are treating each other the best it, it's that simple i mean if you're a christian you should treat other human beings better than any you know it, you should not have to have someone tell you you don't behave in certain ways because we are supposed to view each other as the images of God. And I think that's one of the things, you know, if we want to use the marriage analogy and we're looking at the the, the temple, we see how this exile really, it, it occurred because, you know, it, for continue, you know, major uh, analogy language here, Israel neglected their spouse. Israel started, you know, giving God second best. Israel wasn't participating in intimacy. Uh, 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 you know, there's so many ways we can look at this. And it became where, yeah, the old lady at home, we don't have to really pay attention to him. You know, that's the old ball and chain. And it's that kind of derogatory mindset that they were practicing towards God. And, and Solomon, what he's setting us up here in this prayer, he's saying, if there's not the proper respect and there's not this this love and devotion for God that that is expressed through deeds and actions, not saying that deeds and actions buy you salvation, but the love that you feel isn't expressed through those deeds and actions, there's going to be consequences. So he doesn't negate the 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 conditions of the Torah in the in the operation and function of Israel's history. He affirms it, and so. At the same time, there's that beautiful tension where when God t- spoke to David, the, the, the covenant God made with David says the love will always be there. That doesn't get taken away. And my desire to have you as part of my kingdom is always going to be there and to have you as my king. However, if there is sin, if there is iniquity, then I will respond and I will respond appropriately. That's the reason why there's discipline, and that's the reason why, you know, there's this chastisement. And yes, sometimes it's severe. Why? Because you don't let people damage you when you're in a relationship with them, and not on a continual you know, abusive kind of way. That, that's not good. That's not good for you, and that's not good for the other person. So God says, it's, 
we're going to have a respectful relationship where we do honor each other. And that's, that mm-hmm. really is the beautiful part. And when you get down to it, because this building of the temple, it's not an obligation that's set on Solomon that he just, I got to do this. And it's not an obligation put on God where God has to be here because Solomon built it. It's where the two mutual desires to be together and to honor each other culminate mm-hmm. in this this space where God can be manifest. And that is what I think so much, what we miss so much of the time when we're talking about the Bible, it's supposed to be this mutual honoring and desire that doesn't place obligations, but it inspires this 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 want to to be together and the desire to be together so anyway yeah, we're well, over I, mean, <laughs> I know we're over and, and we're kind of far afield but there is like you're talking about this mutual honoring i feel like you know paul talks you know, when paul writes about treating others regarding others as better than yourselves mm-hmm. um i feel like we we kind of lose a lot of that in the way we're taught how to act that out in churches where it becomes not so much of an, a mutual elevation, but a self-denigration yes. uh, to a point that's unhealthy in so many mm-hmm. situations. Mm-hmm. And we need, to, we, we, need to have, we need to have bigger imaginations than that. <laughs> I know it's, you know it's not a pretend scenario, but we, we need to be able to imagine what it looks like to honor people um, in ways that elevate and and yeah, does that mean sometimes giving up a thing or two and mm-hmm. or giving up more than you would normally sometimes, but to the point if we're if we're to the point where where we're expecting people to give to the point where they are um losing the, you know we're not treating them as human mm-hmm. or or we're not treating them as as equals um then then we have a problem yeah. um because I have seen that where the idea of treating others as as regarding others as better than you has has been played out as you know well, we need to the, uh, we we do need to uh keep d- degrading ourselves so that that person can look better and it's like well no we need to be building each other up mm-hmm. and i've been in places where there is a healthy building up of other people and where everyone pitches in but it it's not ever to a point where we are anyone is feeling uh, dehumanized or denigrated or anything like that. You know, what's funny about those kinds of situations is there's always room for each other when you build people up. When you're making the other person bigger, it like actually creates more space for you to be a bigger person. Uh-huh. Uh, it's, it's amazing how that works. So, but whenever you start tearing yourself down, it also has an opposite effect where everybody else seems to try to become smaller in order to, to match. And it, that's not how this is supposed to work. And so you know, we, we need to operate at the height and the fullness of the capabilities and giftings that God gave us. And that doesn't mean steamrolling over other people, but it's also creating the opportunity for other people to do that. And if we would actually right. start creating those opportunities and chances within our body, it's amazing the gifts and the skills that are going to come to the forefront. And we're going to see, you know, people doing things we didn't even realize they could or would do with such beauty and grace. And so it's just, yeah, it can be really an amazing thing when people are willing to, to honor each other with that mutual kind of love and commitment that we see portrayed here. We see it in the Mm -hmm. old Testament. It's not a new Testament idea. It's something that's been part of God's creation since the beginning of time. So, yeah. Well, it's like, you know, different theologies that are, if you have a theology that's constantly worried about stealing glory from God or worried that they're going to, you know, outshine God, don't worry, you're not. Um, So, um, (laughs) You were not anyway. that capable. Uh. <laughs> so I think we should leave it there. Um, seems like a good place to end. Uh, completely uh, <laughs> randomly far afield of where we were, but it's all good. Um, again, we're not to say, and that's the thing. Like we'll admit when we get kind of far afield, we're not saying that that this is the isogetic, uh, you know, the exegetical <laughs> reading of this text. Um, we're just saying, hey, this reminded me of another thing that is somewhat related and this is tame for the way we normally have conversations so if you're having problems following us here where i have an outline i kind of follow imagine what dinner with us is like so (laughs) yeah it's a lot of fun but 
Hey, come be part of the conversation. Raven Creek SC on the social media. RavenCreekSC.com is the website. And uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you next week. Thanks. Bye. You've been listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, a Raven Creek Social Club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.